Let us pray together. Gracious Lord, we thank you. Thank you that we can come into your presence. And that because you made the promise that said, when we gather together in the name of your son, you are here. We pray that you would open our hearts and minds to your presence. Turn the focus of our attention to you. Open up our hearts and our minds to that which you would like to work in to us and what you would desire to do through us. And so we say, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I have to tell you, ever since Larley and I first pulled up on the property, what, gosh, like an hour or so ago, I've been catching my breath, and I've been catching my breath looking at all the new stuff that's happened around here. I mean, of course, as soon as we began to pull into the driveway, there's this extraordinary sign that actually has stuff on it that tells you what's actually going on. It's not just a monument. It's a living piece of communication. The land has been cleared. You can see the church, which looks terrific. It's hard to believe, quite honestly, that it's only been a year. Because it was just a few days ago, this time last year, that I came to preside at Cynthia's celebration of new ministry. And I just want you to know, I think it looks phenomenal. And I'm thrilled. But I'm thrilled for a very specific reason. Because the openness that has been created here and the welcome that the sign communicates says something that is, in fact, a very important gospel value. And the gospel value is, no matter who you are, you're welcome to come. That's a gospel value. Because you see, most churches, sadly, and certainly lots of organizations, clubs and things like that, say that, but then they have a whole hierarchy system that lets you know you're only welcome if you act like we do, or you're, if you're from the same background that we are. And there are even little buzzwords that people use to sort of let you know, um, I, I'm pretty important here. So you better pay attention to what it is that I say. Uh, as a joke, we gave Laurel and I uh, to Ernie Bennett, former canon to the ordinary, uh, an apron. A reason we gave an apron, because he was all over the diocese and literally going from place to place, which meant he had a lot of food and drive throughs and one of the things you, you know is that, may know is that clergy shirts, particularly purple ones, are very unforgiving. Um, all you need is a little bit of ketchup, and there it is, right there. And so we gave him this op apron, but Ernie had a little saying, and it was a joke. It, it wasn't serious. He, he said, you may not know this, but I'm kind of a big deal. <laughs> and, and so that's what we had embroidered on the apron. Truth of the matter is, he was an extraordinary and is an extraordinarily wise and humble man. The reason he could hold that up as a joke is because there are lots of churches that have people that may not have the apron, but they sort of say, in a way, I'm kind of a big deal around here. And that's because they have cultivated for themselves a place of power and influence. You could have a church of 20 people and still have one of those people. Um, there was, there's an, actually a story. I was listening yesterday to the presiding bishop speak, and he was preaching out of one of the epistles, and it talks about Chloe. This is in 1 Corinthians. And he said, I hear from Chloe's household that there are divisions among you. And he turned in and he says, you know, every church has a Chloe who wants to gossip and tell you what's really going on. <laughs> She's one of those people, you see, who says... In a way, because I have insider information, I'm kind of a big deal. And it's a privilege for me to let you in on what's actually going on, so you better pay attention to what I have to say. It, it's, it's part of it is endemic to human nature. For us to build collections of people around us who, by virtue of what it is that we contribute, uh, allow us to in some ways feel important and affirm, in essence, who we are. But if that's actually the dynamic of what happens 
in the life of a local church, in essence, what it creates is an in-group and an out-group. And if you've got an in-group and an out-group, you're not doing what it is the scripture says about what the role of a church is supposed to be. It's not that you don't and should not have leaders. You should have leaders. But leaders who, among all the things that they do, regardless of their responsibility, whether it be vacuuming the carpet or running a vestry meeting, do so with an understanding that, you know what my job is in this role? My job is to be your servant not to lord it over you and use the responsibility I have to my own personal advantage. Doesn't mean that you're not tempted to do that. But the fact of the matter is, is that it's something to be laid aside because of how we understand the nature of what it means to be a Christian. You see, Paul begins the Ephesian lesson this morning by saying, in this place, you might used to have been aliens and strangers. But that's not true now. No matter who you are, Jew, Gentile, and he could have said if he used our language in group and out group, all of you have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You are all invited to partake of the, very Episcopal word, the inestimable gift. Do you know we used to have a quiz in seminary, could you say inestimable or not? The gift, see, that's another in-group, out-group thing. Um, to be able to know that you have been invited in, and you've been invited in by Jesus himself, and he, by virtue of his death and resurrection, the blood shed on the cross, speaks to you an eternal word of acceptance, of mercy, and forgiveness and calls you out of those gifts to yield the authority of your life and to serve him above every other authority. Later when we get to the service of confirmation, reception, and reaffirmation, you'll hear that spelled out in some detail in the commitments that will be made. And they will say, those making those commitments, I will notice with God's help, because this is big. You see, all of us really do desire some place of authority and some place of power where we are known for something that we do. Or if we deal with deep places of shame where we're not known for what we do or what we might have done in the past or even what we're still doing now that I sure as heck hope you don't find out about because that's going to sure change the way you think about me and I'm doing my best to hide that kind of behavior from other people and I want to put my best foot forward. All of that behavior communicates that in the heart of hearts of each of us, we want to be in the in-group because we know there's an in-group and an out-group. And the challenge of a church is to go out of its way by serving one another in love to say, by our behavior, you're welcome here. It's what your sign says. And what that means is all of us are invited together by the blood of Christ to kneel before him, come under his authority by calling him Lord, and out of that, learning how to love and serve one another in the strength that God supplies. I will with God's help. Can I tell you that it's a challenge every single day to live like that? I mean, I have things I want to do today. And what if something gets in the way of my plan? And how am I going to respond to that? Or if I can't do the thing that I've committed to doing because of this and that, that means I've got to make an excuse to somebody and, and try to let them know that, you know, I really tried, even if I didn't, right? <laughs> I mean, all of us wrestle with this deal around needing to put our best foot forward, which means we actually need one another, one of the purposes of the church, to be in the midst of a body of people 
who really take what Paul says about the role of the church really seriously. And we're trying to find a way, learn how to be, and demonstrate to others what it means to be a people where there is no in-group and there is no out-group and we're all loved and cared for. And we all can find a way to call Jesus as Lord together. I mean, I want you to know, I can count on one hand churches that even want to talk like this. Are you there? I mean, this is a challenge. And to call yourself Christ Church says volumes about that commitment. Because what you're saying is, all of us, no matter who we are, whether we can say inestimable or not, <laughs> are under the authority of Jesus Christ together because it's his church. And we're trying to find a way to yield to his authority here. Not the authority of the matriarch or the patriarch or the person who's been here the longest or the power broker who may not have a lot of room up front, but believe me, that person knows how to get things done. But instead, we're trying to find a way to learn how to be servants together, to learn to accept one another in love, to call and work together to figure out what it means for Jesus to be Lord of my family, my relationships, money, how I relate to my occupation, what I do with my time. And I begin to understand with other people what it means to live a life that looks like this kind of servanthood, wherever I am. Whether I'm at the convenience store, at a restaurant, whether I'm at a shopping center, and I, I'm still a servant. I still belong to Jesus. And I'm trying to find a way to get rid of these persons so that I'm not this way with this group, and this way with this group, and this way with this group, and I hope the people in that group don't see me over here. You see, all of that is still based on I'm trying to find an in-group <laughs> and get accepted here, you know? This is not easy, but it is in fact, as Jesus describes it, the only way of freedom. To understand that the radical call of what it means to be a follower of Jesus means it challenges everything I understand about the nature of what it means to accomplish, what the nature of power is, how I operate in a way that is not demonstrated more often than not by most churches, most political organizations, even the news. It all assumes that we're all kind of in it for ourselves and we're trying to take care of me regardless of what happens to you. If there's anything that for me describes our present political climate, it's just that. Just raise the question of vaccines and see what kind of reactions you get. We, by contrast, have been called by Jesus Christ as servants who are learning how to prefer one another in love, who are trying to figure out a way to get along and to demonstrate that kind of belongedness both to every single person who walks through these doors, but also to the community at large. So that when a visitor comes through these doors of Christ Church, you can say without hesitancy, we're learning how to try to care for each other here. We want to figure out what it means to be servants here. We don't want there to be an in-group and an out-group. We want to be people who are known, all of us, God being our helper, is just followers of Jesus. Because it's his church. It's Christ's church. I belong, but it's his church. So as we enter into the service of confirmation, I would really urge you to say, what does it mean for me to be a follower? And can I tell you, it really is freedom. It means I can learn how to lay down pretending. I can learn how to open my heart to God and to do so in a way that I'm not worried about what you're thinking about me over here. 
I mean, did you notice the collect at the beginning of the service is actually an extraordinary admission of need and humility? And if you're going to say that prayer with any kind of reality to it at all, it means a willingness to actually open up the deeper parts of your heart and show your vulnerability to Jesus. Have compassion on our weakness and mercifully give us those things for which our unworthiness we dare not and for our blindness we cannot ask. That's big. You're not going to hear those lines in a television show. And yet, that's the invitation that we're given. And why can we pray like that in the presence of God? Because God, in fact, has already drawn us near and invited us in. Mercy, forgiveness, peace, acceptance. You belong. And the way, more often than not, that gets demonstrated is when a human being comes up to another human being and by his or her actions out of character to what they might expect, demonstrate that kind of mercy, that kind of peace, and that kind of acceptance in a way that allows me to begin, because it's not easy and it takes a while, to let down some of my guard. And out of that, learn how to be real in the presence of God, in the midst of God's people. When that happens, miracles happen. When that happens, real worship takes place. So that when we say, for example, lift up your hearts, your heart rises to the occasion. It's not just a phrase in the liturgy. Because there's a reality to it. We're not acting out a drama as much as we are expressing the heartbeat of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And we're thrilled to be here. That's what I want for Christ Church. Worship that sings with the presence of God. But not because you've got good musicians, though you do. But because our hearts are learning how to trust him. Our hearts are learning how to trust one another to be who we say we are. Even though it can feel terrifying at times. Because we're a people who are learning from one another the mercy, the peace, the trust, the acceptance of what Jesus gives us as he calls us together to follow him as Lord. So, beloved, here's what I want you to do. Every sermon has some application. Two decisions. When the next time we sing, I don't know whatever it is, I would invite you to sing a little bit from down in here rather than just in here. Express something through the lyrics that comes from inside of you. And when we say the liturgy, the same. Not just, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, but Father? Come. Let's find a way to know the joy of his presence. Let us find a way because we have been welcomed by Christ to be that welcome for other people. Amen.